Thomas Kline. So the Chinati Foundation, how many of you have been to Marfa or know about the Chinati Foundation? And yeah, I don't have to say so much about it. Yeah, okay. Uh, and and Tomas, uh, Thomas Kline um, is only uh, the second director in the history of the foundation. I had the pleasure of living in Marfa for a couple of times with a Lannan writer in residency uh, twice. Uh, they have wonderful houses in town where writers come and live and work for months at a time. Uh, and of course, every week or so, I would go over to the Chinati Foundation and spend time in one of the world's most sublime spaces, these huge artillery sheds with the sunlight just pouring in and dissolving these 100 stainless steel boxes by Donald Judd. That's an extraordinary place to sit and think about the nature of time and think about flow and our place in it. I think that Thomas Kline probably has some plans for the future as well that we'll talk about that. Thomas, please. <laughs> Where do I push? Right here? Ah, uh, yeah. Good. Yes, uh, let me start with uh, an aerial view. It's Fort D. A. Russell. It's a military fort that ceased to exist in 1946. The whole story basically began with Apaches and Comanches ruling the area not only of Marfa but the whole borderline along the Rio Grande. There's a wonderful book out by an old historian, 93, 94 old, years old, uh, The History of Marfa and Presidio County, telling the story that neither the Spanish nor the Mexicans nor the Americans were um, able to conquer this part of the United States. It has been the Apaches and the Comanches into the 1860s, 1870s. Uh, then the idea came up uh, to have a courthouse in this area just in the center of Marfa and a jail. Um, the railroad, the courthouse, the jail made it a livable place. The place has been called Desplopado, uninhabited, because the Indians were coming from all over the place, like out of a nirvana uh, to beat you and to rob you and uh, to steal your cattle or to kill your cattle. This was the experience of people living in Marfa, so it has been people who were excited about this area, and I think this is what it's still about. Um, Fort D.A. Russell started as Camp Marfa in 1911. The reason simply was the Mexican Revolution the Mexican Revolution uh, bringing in a lot of illegal people into the United States who were refugees or who were preparing uh, uh, additional revolutionary acts from the territory of the United States. So Camp Marfa has been uh, founded as a, a tent camp by soldiers in 1911. And what you see here uh, is the result of even the time of German war prisoners on this camp uh, during the 1940s. Donald Judd uh, came to Marfa first time in 1971. Um, he decided to live, to acquire two hangars uh, that were for sale, uh, not part directly of Fort D. A. Russell, and he established his own museum uh, in one of the hangars, including a library, including a courtyard where he could sit and cook outside, including also his um, spaces to live in. And here you see the arrangement of his art, um, the red colored pieces, wooden work from the early 1960s, starting 62, 63, when he went into three dimensions. Um, usually, Judd liked to have at least one piece of furniture in a room because he didn't want the separation of art and life. The predecessor of, uh, let's say, the artistic Camp Marfa that you've been seeing for a second is the famous building 101 Spring Street that is owned by the Judd Foundation that is under renovation currently that is going to open if everything goes well throughout the year 2012. It is a four-story st cast iron building uh, at the corner of Mercer Street and, uh, sorry, off the corner of Spring Street and, uh, what is the other one? I'm sorry, it's, I'm, um, it's one of the last cast iron buildings uh, in, in Soho. 
and uh, Judd emptied all the floors and again you can see a beautiful work of Dan Flavin diagonally, the piece out of the fluorescence and at the wall you see in the back of the room a piece by Klaus Oldenburg and in the front of the room of a piece by Judd himself and the bed uh, on the ground plus uh, the uh, little seating device. Um, again, back to Marfa, you see the courthouse here since 1882 at the end of uh, Highland. On the left side, you see the office, the white office of the Judd Foundation. On the right side, you see Marfa Book Company. This is the place where all the Lennon Foundation um, residents are reading after they have spent some time in Marfa. It is a wonderful place. Marfa is uh, remote. It needs you two and a half hours of drive either from El Paso Airport or from Midland Odessa Airport. Um, if you go faster, you will be stopped by the police or by the Border Patrol and get a speeding ticket. Uh, the little village or the little city itself has about 2,200 inhabitants, but I think it is never more than half of it there because the others are either in New York or on the West Coast or traveling elsewhere. Judd came here in 73, as I said, because he wanted to create a new place for his art. He was uh, kind of fed up with New York, with the gallery system, with the museum system, like a lot of artists, uh, starting maybe Michael Heiser, Walter de Maria, leaving New York uh, to find uh, places in the Southwest uh, to create their works there. Also Robert Smithen, um, going to um, examine New Jersey and other places near the city to start uh, what has been, I think, very nicely elaborated uh, this morning, what could be called something like ecological art. And Judd, however, was uh, pondering for quite a while. He was going for summer vacation to the southwest. He was really checking out the places. But when he decided to go to Marfa in Texas in 1973, he said decidedly uh, that can be seen in an early footage by a Michael Blackwood film that is basically unfinished that he went to Texas because Arizona was already too crowded. <laughs> so the piece you see here, this is the beginning of Judd's career that led to the Chinati Foundation. Uh, upon invitation from DIA Art Foundation, today named DIA Center for the Arts, Heine Friedrich and Philippa Pelizzi, his wife, a daughter of the de Menil family residing in Houston, uh, they commissioned him in 1979 to do this outdoor piece of uh, concrete uh, cubes uh, that are dispersed throughout the landscape from pretty much north to south uh, in the length of exactly one kilometer. All the pieces uh, are equal in size and they are standing there in groups of uh, two to six uh, modules. And the highlight that came later on, this is not stainless steel, it's uh, milled aluminum. This is 100 uh, boxes. Uh, did, this is the follow-up commission by Dia Art Foundation. And this is basically the highlight. This is the reason, more or less, why people come to Marfa, why they come to see the Chinati Foundation. Louis Hyde has called that piece the Taj Mahal of the United States of America in 2010 in the summer issue of Art Forum. And as a matter of fact, it is, um, of course, minimal art. It is, of course, a, a classical piece by Judd. But as you can see, at the same time, it is, um, you know, a three-part uh, installation in two buildings, so it is like uh, a little bit like a cathedral, like a basilica structure. You have these uh, equal spaces between the boxes. You have the equal spaces between the three rows within the buildings. The building itself is industrial. It is part of the Fort D.A. Russell. It has been used as um, during the war uh, to house the uh, German uh, war prisoners. And Judd has emptied it all. He has really stripped it down to its essence. And you will see uh, a couple of pictures of that later on. And none of these 100 boxes equals the other. They are all 
alike in uh, the volume, all alike in the material he's, he's been using, but none of the shapes equals the other because he is using uh, eight inches uh, measurements as kind of small compartments to create differences. He uses vertical and diagonal uh, metal slabs and it, besides that it's all screwed together. It's a piece done by Lippincott uh, in um, Connecticut. Uh, the reason to start this work was basically what Judd found. So Fort D.A. Russell was no longer a fort since 1946. What has it been? It has been the artillery sheds where that house, the 100 aluminum pieces, um, has been used as a garage to repair trucks. Uh, and Judd took all the windows out, the sliding doors, and there was no roof um, on the building. Uh, he really literally put a lot of garbage away. He emptied it, it, he cleaned it, he put a new concrete floor inside. He um, was reworking the ceiling and he was putting a roof on top, basically for the reason of having a nice proportion, the proportion of one to one, so doubling the size. Uh, the roof, however, and uh, I'm starting to talk about the future, the roof uh, always caused uh, a water problem, so it was leaking already from almost the first year on, and it is not leaking right now terribly, but this is something we have to do in the next couple of years. Here you see the building again with the typical uh, squarish glasses, a principle that Judd has been using later on also for doors at the Ginati Foundation. The work started to be installed in 1982 and it took Judd four years to finish it and the roof on the two buildings was just uh, put on uh, pretty much at the end of these four years. Here you can see it as you encounter it today. You look through the windows onto the piece. You can look uh, outside from inside and the piece is, uh, is enlightened only by the sun and the moon. We have uh, sunset and sunrise guided tours twice a year and uh, if you go in there throughout the middle of the day it's very very bright and in the evenings and in the morning the aluminum turns like a little bit into yellow, pink and purple. Uh, Judd did not want to create a monument for himself or a museum for himself, although the principal idea of course was to create an anti-museum. A museum, first of all, not ruled by a museum director and a group of curators, but by the artist, him and other artists himself. So he was inviting the closest friends, those artists he really adored the most, and one of them whom he already uh, ex declared to be a, a, a competitor on the highest level was John Chamberlain. And here you can see um, the Chamberlain building, the Chamberlain Museum, that is equally an essential part of the Chinati Foundation. And you have again this principle of windows that also function as doors, one of the architectural inventions of Judd for these kind of buildings. Chamberlain has used the former Wool and Mohair Company downtown in Marfa, also an abandoned building. So really Marfa was um, a little bit a no place from 1946 on until Judd came, which was no, not really um, visible before the end of the 1970s because it was Dia who pumped some money into this town to create these installations and originally the 100 aluminum pieces were designed for this space but then Judd realized that without the light uh, these works could not really live very well and he dedicated this space to his dearest friend uh, John Chamberlain who has there a museum of work from the late 1960s to the 1980s. The third artist in the row who had this major importance is Dan Flavin. 
a very old companion. Uh, those who have studied the art of the 60s know very well that Judd and Flavin pretty much developed their icons, their pivotal works in the course of 1962-1963. Both artists have been extremely fond of Barnett Newman, maybe the strongest influence you could say for this kind of minimal art if you do not consider Carl Andre who started a little bit earlier. And Flavin has used uh, six of the barracks to create a light piece that I will show you in a few more examples. And uh, each of these spaces is filled by lights of two colors that are repeated uh, in the two wings. So you go from one barrack to the other, and each time you have two wings, so it is, let's say, a 12-fold a uh, work of art that has been finished only after uh, Judd as well as Flavin passed away. This work is uh, part of the Cinali Foundation collection only since the year 2000. There is a lot of humor in this area as well, although you do not expect this from minimal art, but uh, artists number four and five are Klaus Oldenburg and Kosche von Bruggen. And when they have been invited by uh, Judd, they were walking around and uh, Oldenburg heard the story of the so-called last horse at Fort D.A. Russell, the horse called Luri. Um, as a matter of fact, this horse wasn't the last horse, but it was a particularly old horse, seemingly was not only 20 years old, but close to 40 years old, although I don't really trust that age, but uh, a very good historian tried to make this point only on May 1st uh, this year. Uh, so then they found a horseshoe and they were assuming automatically, the artist and Judd, that this must have been the horseshoe of Luri. The horseshoe has been enlarged and this uh, nice nail has been put inside and this is a sculpture that is approximately uh, 15, 16 feet high. That also needs restoration, but uh, we are sure we can do this uh, throughout the year of 2012. The barracks that I haven't uh, shown you really from the outside, except in the aerial view, have been also given to artists uh, Ilya and Emilia Kavakov, uh, who uh, turned one of them into a so-called school number six, which is uh, a school for Siberian uh, children uh, that, of course, were never there in Marfa, but uh, Kabakov's idea always is to give you some narrative on a kind of a fairy tale situation that could be true but isn't quite true. Uh, the basis, the basic assumption for this artistic idea was that Kabakov said military and uh, school, this is pretty much the same. Um, so when you walk inside, you have these really awfully fake walls of a uh, very cheap and, and thin uh, kind of wood that has been painted in this turquoise uh, green. And you see one of the benches upside down. You have uh, red flags, you have Lenin, uh, you have Karl Marx, uh, you have uh, musical instruments there, and a lot of little diary material either that the teachers have been blaming and um, torturing uh, the, ch the children or the hopeless ways how the kids try to do their homework right. Uh, it shows, um, let's say, the uh, grandeur, the uh, big heart of Judd that he invited uh, not only colleagues with uh, minimalist artistic programs but also Kabakov, uh, Oldenburg and von Bruggen. Uh, a part of this whole place is the former gymnasium, uh, also a riding school of the military uh, called the Arena. This is where, uh, you know, bigger gatherings uh, take place. Should any of you come to the Chinadi weekend, which will start next uh, Friday, we will have our so-called members dinner that is open to the members and to the community with, inside this building. Uh, Judd again sealed a couple of the windows, in this case uh, downwards on the ground floor, and all these concrete walls are uh, built to create an outdoor barbecue place. Uh, he didn't change anything structurally on this building. Um, as I speak about the future, 
I want to mention one artist that left a plan that hasn't been fulfilled yet. This is uh, Bob Irvin. Judd um, had a lot of artists he adored, youngest being Ronnie Horn, who created uh, a piece for one of the barracks, uh, another Carl Andre, who donated about 460 of his poems, and last year a beautiful outdoor sculpture he created for one of the exhibitions that my predecessor, Marianne Stockerband, realized um, shortly before she resigned. And uh, Bob Irvin uh, is the man who supposedly does a sculpture project in the former hospital of Marfa. We are in the middle of finishing construction drawings for this project and we hope to be able to start fundraising for this uh, amazing uh, future venture uh, in the beginning of uh, 2012. Another idea which is unfinished, which points into the future, is uh, realized in this uh, concrete building that Judd himself um, erected there in 1989. It's actually two buildings. One is more or less finished and the one in the back is uh, has been interrupted. Um, and altogether it will be 10 buildings that will house work by Judd that has been created in the time from 1979 to 1983. It is mostly either wall progressions or stacks up and down the wall, plus a couple of uh, floor pieces. These works have been produced, however, these buildings have never been erected. Uh, if that could be done uh, during the next five to eight years, I would be extremely happy, of course. Um, he's, you see the uh, outline of these buildings. They are um, supposed to stand on a, a rectangular footprint. Uh, it will be s uh, different sizes of buildings, however equal heights. Um, the whole Chinadi is about giving art its special character, being quiet, being uncompromised. People have to decide whether they want to come and see it or not. Uh, we do education, but on a level that is, um, let's say, basically we're working without uh, media, without large groups, without microphones, without a lot of, um, don't misunderstand me, propaganda. Judd wanted people to see the art in a certain kind of isolation, in a mood of, you know, being quiet, being pleased, being on their own. And uh, this is something uh, that makes uh, Chinadi a kind of a paradigm of the Contemporary Art Museum. Um, Judd himself was always very, very proud that he was with his 101 Spring Street building, maybe the very first one uh, to present this mixture of uh, renovated, even recycled architecture as a museum space and contemporary art that has been installed by the artist himself or uh, the artist herself in, in um, terms of uh, Ronnie Horn and Koshe van Bruggen. And upon this principle, we invite uh, artists in residence who can work there for about three months, who will have their shows uh, at, in one of the buildings of the Chinadi Foundation. We also invite approximately six to 10 interns a year to work there, uh, not only for us, but also for themselves. And the Chinadi Foundation just has um, been there for 25 years, so it's our anniversary weekend uh, opening up next Friday, and I don't know whether I will stay the whole next 25 years, but at least I think between five and ten years I want to spend there to um, work for this place. Uh, I was too quick, but I think this is all right. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, if, I may, if I may make one last remark, because nobody understands what that is. Um, we invite once a year an artist uh, to have an exhibition. And what you see here is, a, is an unknown and brand new series of work by Hiroshi Sugimoto. These are six inches tall pagodas that have inside that sphere his uh, best uh, seascapes. 
So his, his basic work, the photographies of uh, sea and sky that he started in 1980 with Caribbean Sea Jamaica, that made him world famous and now he seemingly turns into an Asian artist. I just forgot that I also brought this slide, so thanks again. <laughs>